it can stop. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was a full day for you, I heard. Uh, has anyone tried to have all the sessions here in this room without leaving? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I see. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's really amazing. <laughs> Uh, Houdini is such a great tour. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Side Effects, for having me this year uh, again for a presentation. Uh, my name is Helge Maus. I live in Austria um, and I make trainings and yeah, I've been paid for playing with software the whole day. That's, I think, yeah, a dream came through, um, true for me. And yeah, most people know me maybe also from other products because yeah, I'm a really driven guy, learning software, try to find workflow solutions. Uh, and uh, in most cases, I always tell the people I'm not religious uh, in selecting software or workflows. Uh, the reason for this is I work now for 15 years as a trainer and in these 15 years, technology has evolved such a big thing. Software came and went, gone, and yeah, I always tried to uh, stay focused on the needs of my clients. Most of my clients, you see it here, uh, come from post-production, uh, also industry, um, clients from automotive, post houses, and so on. And so I always try to look a little bit into what they need in the moment and how they evolve and how they develop. And so you can't say, I am the guy who's only doing this. Then in this um, yeah, work you have a problem normally. <laughs> okay, um, that's it about this. This is the portfolio in the moment. Like I said, it's always changing, always uh, developing and the question maybe now arises, why Houdini? What is Houdini now for someone like me or for my clients? If you want to make feature films, like you saw these great presentations today, okay, that's clear. Houdini is the working horse for simulations, for example, or the working horse now in the games industry, where you say, I make a digital asset, bring it over to a games engine uh, and make a workflow like this. That's great. but. Uh, for many other stuff, why Houdini? I have to confess that I see a really interesting development now and for you as students or artists it's maybe important. If you go for example to an industrial client from automotive, medicine, whatever, they have today delivered jobs and shots which some years ago we said this is a visual effects shot. This has to be solved by a specialized simulation guy or so. And today, someone makes a gas simulation because he wants to show a technical part suddenly and they have to do the simulation work, the lighting work and all the stuff, but they are not TDs. They are really artists, generalists like you maybe. And so sometimes try to think a little bit out of the box where you can use Houdini in all its strengths where you can push into. So the simulations are great, but also you need the procedural approach for other stuff. Sometimes you can deliver a digital asset for someone or, and that's the topic of my talk today, you can deliver maybe some stuff for motion graphics and make abstract yeah, um, yeah, stuff for your um, simulation, uh, for your presentations. And so, I'm a trainer, so uh, I thought about what can I show you. You saw in the morning Manuel and uh, Moritz, you saw the great feature film presentations today, and maybe you have seen also on the Side Effects website Simon from Men vs. Machine, who's doing really crazy stuff uh, with abstracts. And so I thought about, okay, I'm a trainer, I can't deliver you the big imagery. And sometimes it's not so important that you only see the imagery. I see from my trainees, they say, yeah, Houdini would be great for my work, but 
the approach is too hard for me. I don't know how to come into this program. Yeah, and they try to solve everything, for example, with simulations, like uh, uh, the guy here said. Yeah, and sometimes it's only the little things you have to know in Houdini where you can deliver something great. And that is the reason why I said for my talk, I want to have a title like Motion Graphics and Abstracts, and I want to bring you in the tech, uh, in the tech you have to know to get your first start for these projects in Houdini without thinking about big simulations and all this. So, my first question is, uh, who is really a Houdini nerd in this room? Really deep in Houdini, can do everything, knows everything. <laughs> really, there is one, okay. <laughs> Jeff is not there. Okay, um, so who is starting with Houdini in the moment? Yeah, that was exactly the thing, I thought exactly that. People want to learn how it works. And so, let us um, think about what makes motion graphics, normally motion graphics. Some years ago we said, okay, if you can move a text over the screen, then you are a motion graphics designer. Today, yeah, it's a little bit more complicated. The borders between motion graphics and visual effects are a little bit vanishing. You have very complex stuff going on, so we have text on one side, then we have systems like cloners. I talk the Cinema 4D words because it's <laughs> near at my heart, so I talk about clones and cloners, but you can also think in the MASH, um, for example, universe, or however you want to talk about, or the particles approach. You have many clones going on. On the other side, you have splines and trails and things like that you want to solve. You have particle simulations going on. Then you have the whole kind of volumetrics. This is something which is nearer in the idea of Houdini. Yes, this is something you can simulate, volumetric stuff and particle stuff and so on, uh, the real VFX part. And I want to show you now the basic tools you have to know. And so I want to start with you uh, here in Houdini um, to show you the first thing we need are clones. How to get clones? What are approaches we can do? I have uh, here my Houdini open and I, I want to clone something. So for this, I start with the geometry node. I hope everyone has played a little bit with Houdini, uh, not only uh, looked presentations. So if you have a geometry node, that means it's a placeholder. And here on the scene level, you assemble your scene. You heard about this, okay, here you have your objects. But if you make a double click, you dive, dive into this node. And this node is like a container for everything you do afterwards. So Houdini hasn't got um, an approach that you have an, an outliner. You have an outliner, but it's more like a file system. Yeah? So uh, you make capsules of functions which are named nodes, and you stack them together so that you get a full procedural system later on. So we go into this geo, and normally you load a file into this, and I don't need the file, so it's empty. And instead of that, I need something uh, which I can copy somewhere, a clone. So for easiest things, we take boxes. Uh, yeah, this is a box, and if you press the D key, you can change here really uh, fast your uh, display. It's a little bit easier to see here. So this is our box in the moment. And this box we want to clone somehow. And some people who switch to Houdini and they come from cinema or so say, yeah, where are now the great tools? Where's the cloner? Where are the effectors? And yeah, the Houdini is such a great program. Where is everything? Mm, sorry, guys. There is no cloner or effectors. You have to build this by yourself. But you will see it's much more flexible in most cases to do it like this. So, um, what is a cloner? Normally we copy stuff around. So, one approach you can go, uh, do is you can go into the transform nodes and if you have a simple transform here, um, there are different kind of transforms. A normal transform means that you move it around. But if you go here and say, uh, I want to have a copy and transform. And I show you the result. Here you have a number of clones you generate and you have a whole matrix of transformations you can do with this. 
And these transformations can be now used. Oh, uh, I think there's a little glitch with the. Okay, maybe it works like this. Yeah, uh, and these transformations are done now over and over again. So everything you do in this transformation matrix is done for every instance of this copy. It's a little bit like a cloner. Yeah, you can say, okay, I need a whole bunch of them. I go in and say translate one and the x-axis, but I also can go in and say, yeah, I want to scale them around, yeah, and say uh, make them bigger every time you uh, move them. You have here a rotating system, and you can start rotating them every step you do, and so on. And you see, okay, it's a simple kind of clone. The next step we can do now is we can combine this stuff now. So this copy node always works from the center point. So if we now go in here and say, hmm, that's nice, what about taking another transform and move this result somewhere in space? So if you go here and say in this translate, I move it, for example, here, and then we make, uh, take another copy and transform, hook it up and tell, okay, this time, because it works from zero, we can, for example, try now here to oh, rotate this, you see? And every copy is now rotation of the first one. Yeah? And um, this is something you can play now all day. Uh, the big advantage in Houdini is this procedural approach. You see, every step here, you can change every time. So you really can have to think about what you want to achieve. But the nice thing is, you never run into a one-way street. If you now see, okay, that was good, the transform was making the thing I like, but this time I want to do it a little bit different, you don't have to uh, start again. You go in here and say, yeah, that was good, but what happens now if I do change here a parameter, for example? What happens then? And you don't have to do it again. So this is really linear. But what? If I want to go in here and say that was nice, I want this time to have something radial, yeah, different approaches, a radial cloner or something like that. You can tell, okay, if I want to have this system, we saw here we can work with this transform axi thing and uh, make a radial clone. Or in many, many cases, it's much, much better in Houdini to work on an object base. So you take an object, Generate this and use then the point positions of the object for placing all your stuff. So for this, we can, for example, take a circle. Yeah, circle is <laughs> the first step for a radial um, clone. And this circle here, if you take a look, you see it's uh, placed on a plane. You can change the plane here and the size. And this here <coughs> is a so-called primitive. And this is something very unique in Houdini. Uh, in other programs, you have to think about, do I need in the moment uh, something which hosts points or particles? And, or do I need a polygon object? Or do I need a parametric object, for example? In Houdini, you can switch between these worlds really fluently. And for example, for the particles, we'll see this in later examples, uh, particles are absolutely the same thing like points. So if you have points on a mesh, they are also like particles and vice versa. So it's a little bit uh, easier approach. So if I say uh, I'm interested in points because uh, if you have, for example, a copy and stamp node, this is a relative of our copy node we had before. Yeah? This copy and stamp node does the thing. He copies an object and asks where do you want to have this new object. And in the new Houdini version, which I like a lot, you see now these wonderful icons. It tells you exactly that he has a problem. That's nice. Software tells me, Helga, I have a problem. And if you uh, hover over this, you have here um, this uh, really fast wheel. But if you hold down the middle mouse button, and this is one of the most important buttons you use here, you say, OK, I don't know what I have to do. I don't have sources at the moment. So if you now go over these slots, you see, OK, here is the primitive to copy. 
and over this here you need the information where to copy. And if you do this, you see nothing really happens. Why? Because I need positions. And this is the thing. I saw, okay, maybe this tool is wrong, but in Houdini I can say, okay, I only deliver the data now something different. Instead of a primitive, I need now point positions. So a polygon has points, easy. You only switch the generator and you have your result in the next moment. And here, if you go to the polygon object, if you look at this, you see this is a circle which looks like a polygon circle. You are not interested in the polygon circle. You are only interested in the points. And here you see, okay, I have divisions. I can play with this. And this now comes to the point that here you have now uh, your copies running. Yeah? And if you now want to change something, it's really easy. You can change here the original and also these clones, and it's really, really easy. So you see... This is one approach, yeah? You have an object and you can change it really easy here with this. And the next thing we can now try, and this is typical Houdini. You start with really simple. Now you see, oh, I'm happy. Now I understand how it works. Now you can t uh, tell the system, okay, what happens if I, for example, take another object like a grid? You try this and it's really... Uh, changing here uh, the, um, the input, and you have an absolutely new result. Same if you now go in here and, for example, take a volumetric object, yeah, like a torus or so. You see, it's really easy. You can change it later in the process, really easy. Okay, this is a good example for the next problem we have to solve. Uh, if you look here, you see we have a whole bunch of these uh, really big boxes. And what you want to do is you uh, want to change how they look into the world. And for this, we can use a special node, which is named here uh, the point um, node, where you can define how a point transfers information. We will see this in a moment. There's a new one and an old one. I'm more used for the old one, so sorry that I uh, used the old one. And if you bring this in, you see that every point here can have a whole stack of attributes and information. We will use this in a moment for more complex stuff. And what you can do is if you say, now I want to change the appearance of the cubes and the directions, you can tell the system, hey, I want to give you some normals for this. So delete everything. Now I can add here, for example, normals into it. For example, I use the old normals which are there. So I take here, for example, the x normals. And here I use the y normals and the z-normals. And because points are also particles, like I've said, it's everything the same, you can go in here and say, if I want to be later extreme flexible to change the appearance where they look, I can tell now every point where's the up vector. What is the up where to look? And here you can add now an up vector. And this up vector is normally here um, yeah, defined, for example, by y. And suddenly, all the clones are now looking really nice in direction. I can show it, yeah? Switch on and off. Every clone is now looking exactly the direction I want. And the cool thing is now, I can change this up vector in animation or anything. And the clones are always following the direction I want to have. So it's a really powerful system. If you say, okay, the point is used for the position, but also for all the other attributes. Scaling, for example, with p-scale, normals, where to look, and so on. And if you learn to manipulate these point informations, you can do amazing stuff with this. And this is something we want to uh, look in a moment. Yeah, the, sometimes you say, okay, that's nice. Now we had seen linear stuff, we have seen radial stuff, we have seen how a surface is used. Uh, what about objects, filling up objects? How to work with something like that? Hmm. All we need are positions and points. So, uh, we can take this torus, I shake it here really fast, and 
And in this torus, I generate a whole bunch of position. But if you take a really close look, these positions here are not in the torus in the moment, they are on the surface. So, your friend for many of the effects you need is the scatter node. A scatter node makes the following thing. You deliver an input and the scatter node itself generates positions for you or points for you. In the moment, 1,000 points. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole bunch of points, so for testing purposes, maybe 100 is absolutely enough. <laughs> um, yeah, and these points now are placed here now on the surface. And here, you can now tell how the points are found and they are uh, relaxed in the moment. If you normally uh, search for points here, you see sometimes they clump, they are really organic. But if you say, I want to have it really equally spaced later, you can go in here and relax the point positions. And now you see it gets a much nicer appearance. So depends on your creativity. So I go in here now and say, and now please use these positions we've generated here with the scatter to place our clones. Okay, it looks now like that. Um, if I now go in and make my box a little bit smaller, yeah, so I go in here and say, make it a little, you see, these are now our positions. And if you want to change now something in the system, it's as easy as that. Everything you see here is animatable. Yeah, so this is for your own um, creativity then. You can fill this here up and you see it's really working uh, very fast here. Yeah. But what if I want really to rebuild an object? Yeah, so this here is now on the surface. What about the inside? The idea is really the same. We need scatter, we need an object, but this time we don't need a surface. You know every polygon is only a surface. It's an empty shell. So we have to look into this. And Houdini is really good with uh, volumes. And one of the classics is the isosurface. Isosurface, I show it alone, looks like fog in the moment. Yeah, You see here this foggy <laughs> Uh, thing. This is the volume. The volume is generated out of this shell and it fills it up and you can tell the system how to make this fog. And here you see you can increase without any problems here the re uh, resolution. It gets finer and finer. Yeah? This is a nice parameter. And then you scatter the points and suddenly the points are everywhere. Because now you don't deliver only a surface, you deliver a full volume. And this is still working with our copy. And you saw how we worked now the last some minutes. We started really simple with something and we added and we added and we added and changed the parameters. And that's a typical Houdini approach. You have a complex problem to solve. You make a little prototype, your first note script. Try if it works with 100 cubes. Okay, seems to work. And then you can add more and more complexity to it without starting on restarting again all the time. This is really um, the big advantage of this procedural approach. And now you see here are all our clothes. A very popular effect we have now in motion graphics is voxelization. This here is really, yeah, it's filled but it doesn't look really equal. Mm. Doesn't look too good. So, can we make this equal? And where? Hmm. The problem is that these getters here search in a volume and there's no equal um, idea behind this. It's fog. Yeah? So, the torus is okay. That's the thing we need. Yeah? We also need the points later on. But how to get points equally? Hmm. Search for points. And if you look here through the points, you uh, see that there is a points from volume node. Yeah? So it's a little bit like a better scatter. Yeah? So um, you go in here and show me these points. And if I go here now 
and you take a close look here. I changed the point separation for you a little bit. You see that these points this time are really equally spaced. And this is exactly the thing we need for our voxelization. Yeah? So instead of using now the scatter, we take now this information here and use this here for our copy node. And now you see all the cubes are equally spaced. Last thing I have now here is mm, I want to be flexible. In the moment, I'm playing only, only with 100 cubes, but later I need 20,000 cubes. So you have to change at many places everything. If you need 20,000 cubes, the cubes have to be smaller. Smaller cubes means you need more positions. More positions come from this node here, and you see it isn't fun to work like that. Yeah, it makes too much work for you. So how to think about that we can say this is the torus, and the only thing I want to change later as an artist um, is I want to go to the box here and change the scaling of the box. The smaller the box, they fill up. Yeah? So the box scale is for me important. And the Houdini way of doing this is you go into the field, make a right mouse button click, and here you tell the system that you want to copy this parameter. Now it's in the pasteboard. And now you go where you want to paste it, in our case, in the points from volume. Because the point separation is exactly the thing which you need. You need, for every box, an equal space. So, I delete this value here. And now you have to paste. And there are three ways of pasting in Undini. You can paste the value, which you've copied. You can paste here the exp uh, expression. Or you can say, make a connection to it. Yeah, and you see, you get a green highlight here. It's like a keyframe. And if you can read this, I said in the first sentence, Houdini is like a file system. It searches for the box and for the parameter scale. And this is now pasted in here. And if you click the word here, you see it's exactly the same value. You have connected these two together. Yeah, so now you can go in here and tell, OK, if I now go to the box and change here the value, you also get here the same value all the time you work here. And that's exactly the thing I want to do. So the only parameter you have to know in your system, and that's the idea behind this, you build systems. It always fills now perfectly with these sizes. Really easy. And this is now something you can develop more and more. You see, connecting things, think about structure. OK, this is the solution, and then make your interface for this. OK, this is the first block. Now we saw how we can make cloners in every kind of way we get now our first clones. The next concept we have to talk about is attributes. What is an attribute, how attributes work, and how we work with these clones? Because in the moment they are really static. You can generate them, animate it, but yeah, they don't do too much. So I go out here and say, OK, this was our second one. So let us start really fast with the grid. I don't know what my graphics card is playing here in the moment. Funny. OK, but we can make some more points then, hopefully. Yeah, funny. <coughs> OK, let us. It sees like a clipping, but uh, the clipping planes are off. So. Huh? Really? Thank you. Have you seen it today? <laughs> okay. Okay, nice, thank you. Um, I want to show you something about attributes. And for this, you need a good friend, and it's named uh, Geometric Spreadsheet or Geometry Spreadsheet. Every point of this grid here 
uh, has information. You know this. Every point has a position where it lives. And you always can look into the world, which Houdini sees, the values behind this, and you see every point has here only the positions in the moment. You can switch between uh, these worlds here at this, there are points, primitives, and uh, details, and also so on. Okay, now we only have positions on the points. What is an attribute? An attribute is something you want to give a point and information, and you want that this information flows to hold the stream of your workflow until you need this um, point. And you can store it in different ways. The easiest thing you can see here, and we will use it later, is if you, for example, add a color node here, and a color node makes vertex colors. So every vertex gets a color, and if I search here, for example, for a nice orange, uh, what's happening in the background is that every of these points here now has a new color attribute. That every point, uh, it's like a, a backpack. Yeah, you uh, move with your backpack and you have the information on this point. Yeah? And this is a thing we use a lot in Houdini for many different cases. For example, if you say orange is nice, but what about if I go in here and say, I want, for example, um, to color here something uh, reddish, zero, zero. And now I want to use these informations here, um, for, sorry, for example, for uh, adding informations. So I go in here and say, if I clone now something, copy and transform, or copy stamping. Um, this is my point um, deliverer. We need something for experimenting with this. And yes, OK. And every point we have now here in the moment, you can test this with the middle mouse button, has now a new attribute with the color um, which I've added to this. And you see the cubes are not colored, but the information is still there. You can use this information. And one idea behind this would be, if you go here, for example, to the scaling, yeah, this is a good example, or here to the um, translate, you can go in here and say, use for this the color red. And now you see every object here is now shifting. Why? It's shifting one unit. Because you have here the information in the red attribute, yeah, that there's a value of one. That means if you go in here and say this is zero, the objects are not shifting. That means you can have somewhere in your stream an information which you pack on a point, and in every other point of your um, downstream, you can grab this information and use it for manipulating your clone or whatever you want. And this is an interesting system now. You can go in here and say, OK, how to change now this color a little bit more interactively? You can use wax, what we will do in a moment, or you can use a really simple tool, um, yeah, which is named uh, Painted. Uh, paint. So if you add here a paint node, and a paint node is nothing else than a painter. <laughs> yeah, so you have here, if you look here, you have your plane, and uh, here you can tell the system, okay, uh, what you want to do with this painting. You can override something, but you also can define here a color. Yeah, like I've done, it's red. You can replace it, add it, subtract, multiply it, whatever you want with this uh, system here. And if you then start working here, uh, you can now uh, do painting in Houdini. Really nice. What you really do, it's not about painting in the moment. It looks like painting. But what you do is you change the attribute on the point. You give this point an information. And this information you can use later, like I've said, for your copy note. Only these clones are now moving. Not every clone anymore. Yeah, so you, now you paint clone positions. But I used it for positions here, this one. 
Yeah, but you also can go in here and say, okay, position was maybe not the best idea. Uh, what about, let us test here, this is the up position here, and we say, yeah, I want to use it for this here. Yeah. And if this is not enough, I multiply it by four, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, so. And now you have a clone painter. Is it still this? Mm. Okay. I help myself normally with this here. I make a null, ob null object under this. Mm. Works also. Okay, yeah, so um, now in this painting now, you see you paint now the positions, and that's really nice. Yeah, so you can paint with this, say, I need some clones here. You get this here. Yeah, and every time you change now this attribute, something happens. That's the whole idea behind this. Yeah, um, if you know now this, and we try to get effectors now for our system. How to paint dynamically? So uh, you don't want to paint in the first place. You only understood now the concept, okay, information on point, how to use it. Hmm. Let us try a different approach. I go in here and, for example, take a sphere. Sphere is always a good uh, practice. <laughs> and uh, this sphere here, uh, you can make, f for example, to uh, sample polygon mesh. And we fill this sphere up with um, points. Okay. It's not so important how many points, I uh, decrease them a little bit. Then we can now go in here and color them really fast. And these colors, it's like the same like before. You, de you say what you want to change. And now in this stream, we have now exactly this color attribute. And this color attribute now, uh, we can mix with other informations. And if you make this stream a little bit bigger here, you see here we had the paint, I throw it away. Here we have a color and we say everything is black. For example, so in this stream, all points are black. If you now use it for moving stuff, black means zero, not moving. In this stream, everything here is now red. Red means moving. Now we have to mix these two worlds together. And for doing that, we want to move it in the next step. So I take a transform because you need something which you want to animate later want to move it somewhere. And to mix this, because it's attribute, um, if you go now here to the attribute, you can have an attribute transfer. It's like a mixer between attribute rules. You have two streams, both have attributes, and you can decide how to mix them together yeah, and uh, make your stuff. And so what I do is now, I take this stream here, this is the original stream, and I merge in this stream here. And if we take now a look here, you see everything is red now. Yeah? If I disable this, you see everything is black. So in the moment the mix is, this here wins the second input. Absolutely. But if you go in here, you can tell which attributes are mixing in the moment. And we only want to mix the colors, the first thing. And the next thing we do is, I can change here now how the mix is happening. In the moment, every point which is inside of 10 units, and this is extremely wide, yeah, uh, gets now the information. So, say no, I don't want it. Instead of this, I add now a blend. And now you see, suddenly, you get this dot here on the plane. And this dot here is exactly uh, the place where this sphere is in the moment. So, if you go here now, I can template this here for a moment, and I move now my sphere, you see you have now a mobile attribute generator, which you can do everything. You can move it, scale it, whatever you want. Yeah, you transfer now this here in. And this here is now the basic of our copy. So, if we now take this here, you see now directly 
that all the points are moving, which are touched by this volume. And that's the basic concept you can now add and add. So you don't need a color channel for this. A color channel is really nice because you see something. <laughs> so um, that's easy to start, but you can have as many channels or attributes as you like. Yeah, and so you are extremely flexible in doing things. Yeah. So this was a little bit about the first steps here. Um, if you want to scatter stuff around, there's an attribute randomizer, which is really nice if you uh, want to look in this. So you can tell, okay, I don't want to paint. I don't want to have this fall of objects. I only want to have something going on. Yeah, so uh, take an attribute which is there and make something, randomize it. Yeah, and so this is also something you can test here. So if you go to attribute randomize and you plug it in here, <laughs> you see it's really uh, doing its job instantly. And you see normally it shoots on CD. Uh, CD is a local variable. Color, color C, color CD is the complete color, the complete color. And here I used for the copy, you remember, the term CR, which means from the color only the red amount. So that's uh, um, that's the idea behind this. So if you go now here, you can randomize this, and then you can decide. Okay, do I want really to randomize it at this point where every uh, attribute is there, or isn't it better to use, for example, something here? Yeah. So if you now go here and make the randomization here, only this dot here is now uh, making funny stuff. If you now uh, go in here, everything else is still black. If you copy it, only these are randomized, yeah, and not the other clones. So you can bring the stuff up and down like you want. So this is randomization. I think it's really nice and equal. So enough about clones. We have to do something else. The next step I want to talk uh, with you are trails and the concept behind points, trails and all these things here. And how to get a little bit more control in the, the stuff. For this, I start with a circle and I go into the circle here and I switch my circle now so that it lies on the ground and I want to have a polygon circle. And from then I need some points on the circle. So if you hook this up, here you see a whole bunch of points living now on the surface of the circle. Okay, something like that. What I want to do is now, I want to use these points, which are points in the moment, as particles. And normally the people tend to do everything in simulation. That is something uh, people, when they start with Houdini, doing all the time. They think they have to simulate everything. Yeah? Um, the problem with simulation is it's sometimes a little bit time consuming and you don't get the results which you want. That's the problem. Yeah, you try something and you have forces and fields and all the stuff and you try to get a result which you hope you get, but yeah, sometimes you don't get it. So simulations are good for some things, but not good in all the, um, in all the um, circumstances. And in my case, I want that these points here, I make my timeline a little bit longer, so apply this really fast. Um, I want that these points are moving now. And I use them as particles. And if you really want to have an extremely um, customizable system, you have to program this. Oh yeah, now comes programming. <laughs> what is programming in Houdini? You saw expressions, H script. So I have a variable, a local variable, and said multiply this something. Yeah, this is programming really easy. But you can go into programming in um, Houdini also through VEX. And VEX is a really funny language, yeah, because you can code it by code, 
Yeah? And for this, you have the so named Wranglers. They are Wranglers node. Yeah? So if you go here and say Wrangler, you see a whole bunch of little nodes here, for example, a point Wrangler. And this is a node which is for programmers. You see, if you hook this up, you have here the O, oh, a VEX expression, and then you start coding. Yeah, this is something motion graphics designers love coding. Yeah, so get rid of this. Another approach of writing wax is warps. It's the same idea, but yeah, it's a little bit more friendly to you. So if you go here and make a point warp, ooh, I hook it up, go into, you see, hey, if I ever worked in another program like, for example, uh, Cinema 3D, Thinking Particles, or whatever. You see, this looks here a little bit like, huh, I can make these little lines, I make connections. This is nice, yeah? This is something I understand. But the problem with this in other programs is, okay, I see, Vax, if you code this, it's extremely fast. Okay, I understand this. But this here is normally slow. If you do something visually, making uh, connections, it's always slow. The funny thing in Houdini is that if you go out here, select this WAP node, and you take a close look onto it, you see that here is a compiler, a VEX compiler. So what you generate in the moment you make all your connections is VEX code. And this VEX code is compiled in the moment you run your script. So it runs as fast as the real coding. And in the documentation, I don't have tested it, they say it's nearly as fast as C++ for this. So it's the same result, only two approaches you can go. One is a little bit more visual. This here is a little bit more, yeah, <laughs> um, hard sometimes. Okay, so. We want to run over points, and the interesting thing is what I never got when I started with this, there, there was only, uh, this here is a primitive uh, warp, uh, here you need a um, point wrangler, and I thought, oh, so many nodes you have to learn. The interesting idea behind this, there are only wranglers and warps, and the only thing they change is what they run over. So you can switch. You only tell what you want to see. Do you want to work with the points, or do you want to work with the primitives, the polygons, or do you want to work with the whole thing? So if you have the wrong WAP or Wrangler, it's not uh, a problem, switch. <laughs> so here, what you want to work with. So we want to work with the points here. And if you go now here in this field, you now see here um, that you have an input section and an output section. This is the input section. And in this input section, if you make it bigger, you see here is position. And if you go over this, you see uh, the little explanation position, force, age, life. And you see these are all terms you know from particles. But we really have points from a mesh. So the same in Houdini. What you do now is you can go in here and we need something which runs. So we need something which is time dependent. We want to change something over time. And for this, we have here a time slot. So if you want to change a position over time, you go in here and make a multiply. And this multiply here takes the position of a point, delivers it back to the position of the point, and then you need to uh, take the time of this and add it here. It's not the final result. You will see in a moment that this doesn't look good. But do you understand this? The time counts up, and so the position is all the time changed. But what we want is here, we want to add the information of this here to the original one. So we change something over time, and we add it to the original position of the point. Blurp, 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 every time the time goes up, the difference gets bigger and it moves. That's the idea behind this, it's moving now. And hopefully it works. Yeah, all my points are now moving. Wonderful, you've written your first solver.
<laughs> yeah, so all points are now moving around. Yeah, this is not the final result. Now we want to have a little bit more control about this. And we want to have something fancy going on. So how to do that? Hmm. Um, I've played a little bit uh, with this here and I had a little bit of help. Uh, there was a really, uh, it's a really good course from Niels Prayer on uh, C-Sheet Society. If he has it again, make it. It's a really good one, <laughs> uh, Niels Prayer. And um, what you can do here is, um, if you want to have a direction or something like that, you need to get an information into this world, into this warp. To get an information into this, which is not here, you can use a parameter slot. Parameter means you can define by yourself what you want to input into this system. And this parameter here, you can name it. So I say here, that's the direction. And then you can tell here the system what type of data you want to deliver. If you have a direction, you normally have a vector, x, y, z. Yeah. Um, so uh, you don't have a number, you have three floats so that you get a direction, uh, in which direction it goes. And here's a default value. And in the moment you have made this, you see here on the WAP itself, here in this area, you get now an input field. And this is an input field you can change. And this data, which you in insert there, it's delivered into the WAP, and you get it here. And now you have a direction where you want to go. And to do this, we go here again. Um, in, we need the direction. We also need the time. And we want to add the result of this. Here. And hopefully, <laughs> you see now they are moving up. Okay? And now, to make it a little bit more chaotic ideas, you can now start here to add, for example, with turbulences or whatever you want to have. Yeah? So, uh, if you have a turbulence noise here, you can take this here, change the time, and so you make a turbulent approach here. Um, this is an idea, but the next thing is now you have moving particles. How to change now to a trailer? There's no trailer node directly there, so how to get this? Every of these points here can be stored through time. And normally in a new um, a Houdini script runs frame by frame. That was the reason why in the WAP we had the problem that we had to multiply all the time. But what we want is, if you need a trail, you need the position here, you get a new frame, you get the next position here. But to paint a trail, you need also the point before it. So you have to Look always into the system and store the positions of the points. And this is named a solver. Every solver in a dynamic system, if you throw something around in a Richard Bullard system or so, is I have a position, I have forces on this object, and in the next frame I use all these values which are there and add only something to it. That's the reason why you have to play always from the uh, front, yeah, because you have to store the last position and add something in the next one. And this is a solver. And you can add here a really easy solver. This is this little brain icon I love a lot. Yeah. And this solver here, if you hook it up, doesn't make anything by itself. You have to write now your own solver. But it's really easy. You have all your inputs here. These are the inputs you know from there. So you can give as many details into this system as you like. 
And here is the previous frame. That means for every of these informations, there is the previous information from the last frame. And if you look now into the points, you tell the system, okay, this is the point from the previous frame, this is the point in the new one, these you want to track. And so you merge them up every time you do this. The old one and the new one are now merged. And if you press now play again and you go out here, you suddenly see, okay, every of these points are now stored and you get a new one over time. And if you have this, these are only points. You can render points in Mantra. Or, yeah, that's nice. But what you want is a really a trail. And a trail is a spline. And now comes another thing which is really interesting in Houdini. Points are particles. <laughs> Same thing. If you connect points or particles, it's an edge or a line or a spline, like you want. Yeah. <laughs> and so you can build your own stuff. So if you go now here and say, I want to add something. Normally you only get one point, but we don't need another point. We have enough of them. We go in here, see, we want to have polygons. You see now every of these pieces are now connected, which is a little bit like a trailer. You connect everything, everything, but it's not exactly the thing I want. Yeah, because, yeah, it's dangerous. But it's a cool effect. I like it, yeah. So... How to work with this now? We want to know that we only connect points which are the past of the same point. Understand what I mean? So every point has a past and you only want to connect them. And for this, we have learned a concept today. If you go in here and say every point which we have gets an attribute, yeah? And you can add it with the attribute create and every point here has a name or an ID or something like that. I see I have only three minutes left. Wonderful. For an ID, we only need a number, so we don't need floats or so. An integer, a full number is absolutely enough. But now, if you now look here at this point into the geometry spreadsheet, yeah, we have now a field. Every point has now a number. Wonderful, but every number is zero. Uh, yeah, it's the same po name. So we need, in the moment we create this attribute, a name for every point. And instead of naming all of them, we can go in here and say, hmm, take the number of the point. So there's an internal number of the point when it's generated, and this number we write into the name field. So this is point number one, and it's always point number one, and now, if I run this now, you see every point has now a number. And with this information, we go here into our ad, and this time we tell the ad here, okay, connect everyone, that's nice. Yeah, so, looks like that. No, not everyone. I want... I don't have a group, but I have an attribute. Connect them only if they have an attribute which have the same name, ID. So now you connect only the points which have the same ID, and now you have a wonderful trail going on. It's extremely fast, and now you have trails. I'm at the end of the time. I had prepared, I think, maybe two more examples which are more complicated. Um, the idea, like I've said, was that I have many people who come from MoGraph or other tools and they say, yeah, I search all the effectors, all the tools, all the trailers, all the generators, and in Houdini seems nothing there. What's going on? Um, you see, you have to build something. But the cool thing, and I hope you saw this, is that if you have a working system, you add stuff to it, and you can then make it unlimited with the things you clone, you do, and I hope it helps. Uh, if you need more information, um, there's a really nice um, tutorial series on the side effect side. If you go a little bit to the back, where um, you see how MoGraph 
functionalities from Cinemark can be achieved. It's a little bit fast and not very explanatory internally. I hope I helped you in the first step. Otherwise, you can ask in the forums or write us an email uh, or ask for tutorials which explain more. And if you have a little bit money left and you have time, there on CG Society, there's a wonderful course from Niels Prayer, like I've said, uh, who's a really driven guy, really good. Uh, he's also really fast, so he doesn't explain exactly the concept of Houdini, but how it works in the whole system. So with a little bit of basic knowledge, like you hopefully saw here, you can better follow this and yeah, tell us if you need more. I hope you had fun and yeah, I will be a little bit here in front of the room and tomorrow at the booth. If you want to play a little bit with me here in Houdini, you can come to the booth and yeah. Thanks a lot and Christopher. <laughs>